I wanted to lay a foundation. So there's a lot of words. I couldn't find any pictures. And where is Gwyn when I actually do something that he would appreciate? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so there's a lot of, lot of information here. But I want you to see the difference between the early church, what happened, what caused the dark ages, and how we can come forward, and what God is doing, what restoration he's up to. So it's a little bit laying the basic bones of... Um, don't want to get it in the way. Laying the basic bones. It's just a skeleton. There's heaps of other information. Now, when I do this, um, I want to acknowledge that this is not original material. As you know, I am a reader. So there's books by um, John Maxwell. Um, he's done commentaries on the Bible. I've done books by John Maxwell. There's John Garfield. There is... Um, Andrew Walmack's got stuff on this. Uh, Tudor Bismarck. Um, I want to I want to honour them, but I can't even think of all their names and the commentaries that are there and and Josephus and all of that. So there's a whole heap of of things that I've gleaned this from because I'm continually studying and continuously looking to see what God is wanting to say. Now, if I stand here, am I in anybody's way? You can all see, okay? All right. So it's the apostolic house, and this is what. Uh, in, in the contact details that I've, in the, in the form I've asked you to fill out, it is, you know, do you, which of the five-fold giftings do you see yourself? Now, I'm not putting you in a box. I'm not anything like that. But if we can get groups throughout open heaven that are actually have got their own five-fold element, we can actually start to bring some real change. And it's the beginning point of an ecclesia. And I think it's been a long time since since we have lived, church speaking, generally speaking, I think it's been a long time since we've lived intoxicated and under the influence of the Holy Spirit, not just at church meetings, but throughout the day, at work, where, you know, like under the influence doesn't have to mean you've got to be, you know, falling down drunk in the spirit, but under the influence. And um, so this is what they started with. And this is where we lost it. This is what's happened and what God is restoring. So bear with me. It is a bit teaching today. I hope you don't find it boring. But if we understand where we're coming from and where God's taking us, we can move with him a little bit easier. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, You shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be the witnesses of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, Judea, all Samaria, and to the ends and the very bounds of the earth. So as I said before, Sunday, June the 5th, Pentecost, the, the, the Feast of Pentecost is coming up. So we're going to celebrate the Holy Spirit here and we're going to have dinner and do something like that. But they were intoxicated and completely under the influence of the Holy Spirit. The Amplified Bible actually says they were filled with and governed by. So, you know, when you're filled with, with, with beer or, or whiskey or whatever it might be, you are governed by that. You're governed by it. It changes your personality. It changes the way you treat people. You can be a happy drunk or a sad drunk. You can have, you know, your grog closeted away in the wardrobe. You can be banging on the door of the pub for it to open. Um, one of my grandfathers, my father often had to go and bring him home from the pub. And the, the publican would ring up and say, um, you want to come and get your father-in-law? He can't make it home by himself. <laughs> And my father was a teetotaler, so he was never impressed. <laughs> so Acts chapter 2, verses 15 to 16. Listen to this. These men are not drunk, as you imagine. Nine o'clock in the morning. And the people that heard them speaking in tongues thought, my goodness me, these guys are drunk. They're intoxicated. He said, but it's, it's only the third hour. It's about nine o'clock. That instead, this is the beginning of what Joel has spoken about. This is the beginning. So we're coming into the end, right? We're not at the beginning anymore. This has had some time to grow and to flavor. And what I'm saying is, where is the intoxication of the Holy Spirit gone in our lives? Where is the joy? Where is the influence of the Holy Spirit? Spirit. You know, um, it's just so, but the fivefold ministry began in Acts, and the church began by being led by an apostolic team. Now, looking at some of the commentaries, this is amazing, right? Like you sort of think Old Testament, Jerusalem, Jesus, not a huge population, you know, nothing much happening, but the apostolic church reached 25 million people. 
10% of the world's population back then. They went everywhere. Matthew went to parts of Africa. Uh, Thomas went to India. Paul visited England on his way to Spain. I mean, these guys moved around. And they did not have jets. Right? It was, it was, it was not an easy commute. But they, they went everywhere. And so when the church scattered because of persecution, you know what? The believers, they weren't worried about what job are we going to, where are we going to live. They were only concerned about getting the news of the gospel of the kingdom out. It was not about salvation. It's about we've got a king, we've got a new kingdom that's here. And so they spread this, this whole thing. So let me just read. The New Testament is, is vastly different from today's contemporary church. Um, usually we go to church when in reality we are the church. So in, back then in the early church, it was made up of individuals who operated 24-7 from house to house. And we are going to be opening up some of your houses as houses of open heaven. I haven't got a name for it yet. I can't think of anything catchy. But we need to be start doing, you know, moving from house to house, inviting people for meals, loving on people. House to house, all over town. They did it as a transforming organism, not as a statistic institution. It will be spirit-led. It will not be because it's the right thing to do because we want to do it or because we feel Pastor Suzette's told us I've got to open the house. It'll be because the Holy Spirit has told you to do something and you're willing to do it. And he will invite the people that he wants into that house. In fact, the New Testament church in the early days, look, I'm so hungry, was so vibrant and so expansive that it overcame powerful political and religious establishments that were bent on stamping it out. The Roman government could not get rid of it. The, Sad the Sadducees and the Pharisees could not stop it. So what are, why are we so wimpy? Like, come on, the Roman government, even Nero, when he used the bodies of Christians as torches for his nighttime parties and they were, he had them on stakes and he burnt their bodies, um, you know, as, as the light for his nighttime whatevers, he couldn't stop it. When they threw the, the, the believers into the arena, well, you know, with the, the state, what do they call it, the gladiator thing, where, and they let the lions and that loose, it couldn't stop it. Nothing could stop the raw power of the early church. And and yet we've been stopped by COVID. We've been closed down by government or tried to. We've not, we've not agreed with it. But so, you know, so we've got to stop and think, what is the difference? The difference is we've not allowed the Holy Spirit to govern our lives. And we've lost the apostolic edge, which is the edge of authority. Gosh, gosh, gosh. In fact, in a matter of weeks, it filled Jerusalem. Acts chapter 5, verse 28, it filled Jerusalem. The city that crucified Jesus, it filled it with its doctrine and thousands joined its ranks publicly confessing Jesus was the Son of God. In Acts chapter 19.10, Paul planted the ecclesia in Ephesus and he declared that all, all who lived in the Roman province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And that was a, an accomplishment, that was about a million people. And he's saying everybody, every one of this million people have heard the word of the Lord right? When Jesus chose the word ecclesia to introduce his redemptive agency, um, it's, it was, it was, well, we're going to go into it later. Um, Silvoso is another one that, that I glean a lot of this stuff from. You know, we, we talk about the ecclesia, Matthew 16, 18. It actually is a very political term. Jesus was saying, this is the government of God being established upon the earth. This is my government and I will build it. The, and King James did not feel happy thinking that the people might actually um, do something like kick him off the throne if they recognised that they could do something with the government. So he changed the word ecclesia to church, an assembly, a gathering. Took all the power out of it. But the church, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, Ecclesia, this is mine, Jesus said. This is my church. Now, there are a lot of churches that are not Christ's. Yes. Right? Get that straight. There's a lot of churches where he's not, he's not welcome, a lot of churches that have closed to the Holy Spirit, a lot of churches built on, on wrong teaching. But his church, his church is the Ecclesia, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen, I agree. So the fivefold ministry began there and it was amazing in that it reached everywhere. 
And um, this is what I talked about earlier. But somewhere along the line, it changed from the gospel of the kingdom to the gospel of salvation, where we're really concerned about the person next door. Are you saved? Are you going to heaven? When Jesus said, I want you to be concerned about discipling the nation. So we live, brought our focus right down to one-on-one -on -one, and Jesus is saying, I want you to concentrate on the, on the nations because there will be a judgment on the nations, sheep nations, goat nations. So individuals, yes, but that's involved in when you disciple the nations, that's when the people come, right? Yeah. So, um, so that's on that sheet of paper down the back, that's by Oz Hillman's Change Agent book. But have a look at this. And, I've, and people in open heaven, I've talked about this before because I find it amazing. This is um, over a two-year period of two families. One is ungodly and Jonathan Edwards, you've probably heard of him in church history. He is a, a, a strong godly leader. Max Jukes was an ungodly man. We'll do him first. Max Jukes married, an, and now this is over 200 years. Max Jukes married an atheist woman produced 560 descendants. 310 of them died as paupers. 150 of them were criminals. Seven of them were murderers. Who would like that in your generational bloodline? 100 of them were drunkards and 50% of the women were prostitutes. Wow. Whoa. And it cost the US government $1.25 million in 19th century dollars. 1800s, two years, 200 years. Now, Jonathan Edwards, um, and there is history on him as a Christian leader, married a godly woman, 1,394 descendants, so almost, almost three times as many, 295 graduated from college, 13 were college presidents, 65 were professors, there were three US senators, three state governors, 30 judges, 100 lawyers, 56 doctors, 75 military officers, 100 missionaries, preachers and authors, 80 held public office, there were three mayors and one was the comptroller of the US Treasury. A godly line. Gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of salvation. Because in the gospel of salvation, most of us are still believing for our descendants, our, our family, to come to the Lord. Oh, we've got backslidden family members. But when you preach the gospel of the kingdom, it changes everything because they see something that is actually can manifest in power and demonstration. So that's a huge difference between a godly bloodline and an ungodly one, yeah? So how did we lose the world when Jesus came to save it? So if they had already reached 10% of their then known world, we should be so far ahead. There are still people groups that have not heard the gospel. Still people groups that have not heard. John 3, 16 and 17, God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son so that whoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him shall not perish but, or come to destruction or be lost but have eternal everlasting life. For God did not send the son into the world in order to judge, to reject, to condemn or to pass sentence on the world but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. And that's why Matthew 6.10 that we use for open heaven is so important because we bring heaven to earth. And when people see heaven on earth, they want Jesus, right? But when we, we seem to be in just as much of a mess as the world, they don't want anything we've got to offer because they can't see the difference. So the skeleton outline for the first 100 years, as we saw it touched nations in the time, there's 25 million people touched by the first 100 years apostolic teams, 10% of the population. Miracles, signs, wonders, like I mean, they even boiled the Apostle John in oil and couldn't kill him. And then they chuck him on the Isle of Patmos and he writes Revelation, like what do you do with a guy like that? Um, you know, and the Holy Spirit filled them, governed them and led them. Yeah. 
And the first question they asked when they met believers or people gave their lives to Christ was, have you been baptised in the Holy Spirit? And some of them said, well, we've been baptised. We know of the baptism of John, but this baptism we don't know about. So back in the 1980s, when there was a revival kind of thing in the Gold Coast in Australia, there were two questions. Are you born again? Or there are three questions. Are you born again? What does the Word of God say? And are you spirit-filled? And it was wild. It was a wild, amazing time. Absolutely amazing. The power of God was on display in the first hundred years. Um, 1 Corinthians 4.20 in the voice says the kingdom of God is not a realm of grandiose talk. It's a realm of power. And 1 Corinthians 2.5, our faith is not to rest in the wisdom of men. Our faith is not to rest in wisdom, but in the power of God. And how often does our faith rest in whether or not we feel we've got a good relationship with God? If we've prayed enough, read the word enough, done, a, done enough things. It's not about that. Our faith rests in the power of God. I had a friend of mine who said last week she's concerned because nothing's really moving in their life the way she wants. And the Lord spoke to her and said, look at the planets. I created them. I started them moving and they're still moving. I've lost none of my power. But when John died, the church contended with incredible persecution. Uh, that was with Nero and other things like that. And apostate, apostate oh, that word, apostate leaders, um, filled the church and started teaching heresy. When Jerusalem was destroyed in, in AD 70, they said, that, well, that's part of the return of Jesus Christ. He's either already been or he's just, you know. And so it was all twisted. And a lot of believers were led astray because the, the original foundation had gone. All of the ones that had walked with Jesus had now gone, passed on to heaven. And so it's left in the hands of other people. And... Um, and there was a shift in church leadership. It shifted from fivefold to management preservation. And the reason they wanted to preserve it was because of the intensity of the persecution. We need to kind of like just consolidate what we've got. You know, like we're losing, you know, people are being persecuted. This is happening. That's happening. We just want to preserve what we've got. And so they went into kind of like a holding pattern instead of being aggressive. Is this making sense? Yes. In the second century, the church leaders moved to a more pastoral shepherding role and the church base moved. It was no longer in Jerusalem. When the persecution came, they shifted the base and every time they shifted the base, um, there was a shift in the way the church governed. Remember what it says in the, in the church to Corinthians? You know, like you've brought Corinthians into the church. That's what happens sometimes. So the church base moved from Jerusalem to Antioch, Acts 13, to Ephesus, Acts 19, to Constantinople and to Rome. And therefore the centre of apostolic authority kept moving as well. The church became traditional and orthodox. It did not operate in the function of apostolic authority, but actually was being assimilated with the Roman government. Constantin, uh, King Constantine had a bit to do with that. And it led to a divide between church clerics and people. It was no longer the body. It was now us and them. So the first thousand years, apart from everything else, Islam birthed. And they had to face the birth and the rise of Islam. The, uh, Islam was in the Middle East. It pushed into North Africa, tried to infiltrate Europe. And its, its mandate is still, disciple the nations, the perversion of what Jesus has taught us. And then there was the Crusades. Now, this is really, really important to understand. When the Crusades came and all these men went, you know, to thinking they were on a holy quest, what happened in the church was that it, it moved from prayer and apostolic authority to physical weapons of, of defence. There was a shift from the spiritual into the natural. Spiritual warfare and prayer moved to physical weapons. You know, we're sending this amazing army. There's going to be this, the natural. And I think it was the, um, the Crusaders that actually started a healing centre on the Isle of Malta. I forget what they call it now, it's still going. But it was a healing centre where people were healed by medicine and things like that instead of 
being healed by the power of God. So there was a shift from the spirit to the natural. And that led to the dark ages. And that's where the dark ages came from. The minute we step out of the spiritual realm into the natural, darkness is given permission. In the 16th century, Martin Luther gets this amazing revelation from God and, and pounds his thesis to the church door. These are the things that I object to. And the 500-year journey to the restoration of apostolic order of kingdom government started. Now, back then, there was no real apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, or pastor. There might have been ministers, but it was the, minis the ministry and the laity. This, you know, so there was a real separation. In the 20th century in Topeka, Kansas, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit which birthed Pentecostalism. Churches had um, still pastoral oversight leadership structures, not fivefold. And then Azusa Street at the beginning of 1900, 1901, whatever it was, the massive Holy Spirit outpouring, just amazing. If you can read anything on Azusa Street, it will just like knock your socks off. It's just amazing. And what happened there was the restoration of the function and the office of pastor. That was when pastor was... Um, started to restore. Now understand, you know, people call me Apostle Suzette. Let me say what Apostle is. It's a title. It's what I do. It's not who I am. I'm a child of God. I'm a kingdom citizen. My function is apostolic. So you've got to remember that. You know, we, we say pastor this and evangelist so-and-so and prophet this. Listen, that's just like saying Dr. So-and-so. Like, just remember, the, these titles are just functions. I, we are all children of God. 1948 was an amazing year. This is when Israel became a nation. Things changed. Watch Israel because when stuff happens in Israel, it affects the church and then the world. So in 1948, Israel became a nation. And there was the restoration of the function of the evangelists. And they rose up. Billy Graham, Jack Coe, A.A. Allen, um, Oral Roberts, R.W. Shambuck, who is absolutely my favourite, R.W. Shambuck. I get to speak to him when I go home. Oh, Jack Coe, William Branham. William Branham was amazing. If one hand tingled, it would be a demonic deliverance. If the other hand tingled, it was healing. He was so successful with the healing power of his meetings that sometimes they had to pull him in through a window because he couldn't access the building. He could not walk through the door. He was amazing, William Branham. He had to park his car a couple of blocks from home when he came back from a ministry trip and come through the back way and sneak in the back door because people were camped in his front yard yeah. waiting for him to come home so they could have ministry. Oh, my gosh. It was just the most amazing time. And it was and, and the healings just went berserk. It just reshaped the world. There were stadiums, massive open-air meetings, tents that held thousands. Teal Osborne, amazing what he did overseas. Miracles were normal. Healings operate. In fact, there's a healing of a little boy that had 25 things wrong with him. I think it was Oral Roberts. It's still on YouTube. And you start just, you can hear the bones click as God... Um, brings him into healing and wholeness. Um, gifts of the Holy Spirit started to come forth, but this was the time of evangelists and healings, restoration of the function. So the pastor's being restored. Evangelists are being restored. Now you've got the restoration of teachers in 19, around about 1967. And, and this was the birth of the charismatic movement. Now what happened in the charismatic movement was all of a sudden, oh, well, I can go and start a church. And so people left and started churches simply because they didn't like the structure of the church they were in or they had a beef with the pastor. I mean, I stayed five years in the church I was in waiting for my pastor to release me. So I did it spiritually, politically, uh, spiritually right. But so thousands left and, and started their own churches, rebellious to what they were in. There was no accountability. They did not come under accountability to anyone and so immorality and some of the bigger churches like um, Jimmy Swaggart he felt that he'd gotten so big there was no one he could be accountable to and that's why he fell into sin 
So there was massive changes around about this time too. Anything, any time anything is birthed in the church, it's birthed in the world in the opposite spirit. So there were massive changes back then. Beatles, Free Love, Woodstock, Vietnam, the assassination of Kennedy and Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement. It was a lot of unrest, defiance and rebellion, which guess what? Was all those people who left their churches and started their own without doing it God's way. Teachers like Max Lucado, Charles Swindle, Kenneth Hagen, Yongi Cho, all of these amazing teachers started rising up and teachings brought order and direction. They brought things back into order. Books and manuals were released. And it's really interesting to note when, when God's, I don't know how to say it, God's, the prophets that God has his hand on, when one of them dies, there is often a legacy birthed into the world. So William Branham died and teachers were released. Um, because he died in 1967, charismatic started, all of that. So watch when a, I'm not saying that we look for the prophets to die, but <laughs> take note of when they do because often there is a legacy that is birthed from their ministry into the world. Catherine Kuhlman died in 1977 and for three days in the hospital where she died there was a fragrance of roses that went through every floor in the hospital and um, in the 1980s there's the restoration of the office and function of the prophet and you can see that prophetic worship, the flags, um, paintings that people do, dance, spiritual warfare, prophetic prayers, all of this was released at a greater thing. God is restoring what has been taken away. Because that is the heart of God, the restoration of all things. So if you can see the history and you can see what God is doing, we can move in with the flow of the Holy Spirit, move in with the flow of God, and we can start to work with him instead of wandering around thinking, what are you doing? <laughs> Sometimes I feel like Mr. Magoo, you know, like shundadadalama <laughs> shundadadalama and stumble into stuff. But when, when we have an understanding, and the beautiful thing is, like with the fivefold ministry, there are seven things that the fivefold ministry is supposed to be doing. They line up with the, the um, furniture in the tabernacle. It's just beautiful the way things flow together and confirm everything and the power of five. Uh, and we'll talk about that next week, to how it affected Abraham and David and so many other people and then moving it into the New Testament, how it aligns with the in a court, holy, you know, all of the, the tabernacle. So the 1990s, you've got a restoration of the office and the function of the apostle. Now, this happened first, really, in Africa and South and Central America. Uh, there are some amazing things that came out of South, Af South America, like absolutely amazing. There was one guy who had a tent of intercessors. Please, God. He had a tent of intercessors behind his meetings and there were over a 1,000 intercessors praying for the meetings that he had. I mean, it was just what happened back then was amazing with the restoration. So the thing is with Central America, Africa and places like that, they are not as in, um, Western educated the spiritual realm is more open to them. It's, they, they live in it, right? Um, and some of the best books coming out now are books written by Africans. So, the, And there was mega churches, major leaders. But the apostolic function in 2022 faces a lot of different kinds of challenges than the early church. But the apostolic church is on the rise. And when the apostolic church arises, authority is released. Finally, I think, ha, oh, come on. <laughs> So the early church, there were no denominations, no technology. How wonderful would that be? They had no drug culture, no legalised sin like we have legalised sin in our community. There was no human trafficking in the scale of today. There was no Christian doctrinal diversity. There was no competition with major religions. It was basically just kind of Judaism. And then a little bit later, Islam was birthed. There was no secularism because the Jews saw all of life as holy. Not just, going, not just you know, the Sabbath, but all of life is holy. They had no formal Bible outside of the Old Testament for about 60 years or so. Doctrinal challenges arrived when the Gentiles came and were added to the church. The Gentiles messed up everything because the Jews are kind of getting along with the Yeshua. Um, things are happening. You know, the, the 
the Messianic church is growing and then all of a sudden Cornelius gets saved and other Gentiles get saved and they know nothing about Moses, they know nothing about the Old Testament, they don't understand um, clean and unclean foods, they eat anything, you know, sacrificed to idols. I mean, these Gentiles came in and messed up the whole Messianic church and so they had to figure out what are we going to do with these people because they're not going away. They had no blueprint to solve issues. Nowadays, if we, we've got an issue in the church, you know, there's, there's heaps of books written by people, John Maxwell, all this stuff. You know, there's places to go for solutions. You don't have to always pray, which is a very bad thing. Um, but there was no blueprint. And, and there were people groups, like there were um, the widows in Acts chapter 6, you know, the, the Greek widows. And all of a sudden, they, they need to be looked after. So they had to think about, well, wait a minute, now we're people groups, we're not just Jews. And we have to learn to minister to them and to solve problems. And they also had to contend with persecution from the Jews and the Romans. Now, we in Australia, we're not really being persecuted. We can see it coming, but we're not being persecuted. You talk to... You talk to the believers in Islamic countries or in India or Sri Lanka or places like that, they understand persecution. We don't. But that's what they did. So that was the early church. So we, we, we have denominations. We have technology. We have a drug culture. We've got legalised sin. We've got human trafficking. We have got so much disagreement on Christian doctrine, uh, particularly around the Holy Spirit. There is competition with major religions. You know, all of this, this, oh, don't offend anybody. Um, there is secularism. There's so many Bible translations. Sometimes it feels like you're talking a different language when it's the same verse in different things. Um, and we have doctrinal challenges all the time. Are women allowed to minister? Are women not allowed to minister? You know, all of this kind of stuff. We have so many blueprints to solve issues that there is total confusion unless you listen to the Holy Spirit. Um, we have got people groups, but instead of coming to Together, we seem to be more divided. COVID divided the church in a way that Satan has been able to do for, for, for years because we had masked and unmasked. We had vaxxed and unvaxxed. And it just brought such a split. Praise God, it did not affect us. But it brought such a split to churches. People left because it would only open to the, the jabbed or people left because it was unjabbed. I mean, instead of coming around Christ, instead of listening to God and thinking the only thing God has called me to do is love, Love, right? It's all he's called us to do is love. So we've got that. And at the moment, not really persecution, but what we do have to fight in this nation is apathy. Yes. She'll be right, mate. Don't worry about it. It'll take care of itself. That is destructive. So lots of differences. But we still need the apostolic authority. We need the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. So the apostolic function is a Holy Spirit and power and demonstration, signs and wonders. It's an empowerment of people, putting tools and life skills into people's hands and then apostolic releasing apostolic individuals or teams to take on nations and mountains as we disciple. Acts 28, 30 to 31. Paul lived for two years at his own expense in his own rented lodging and he welcomed all who came to him, preaching to them the kingdom of God, teaching them about the Lord Jesus Christ with boldness and quite openly and without being molested or hindered. So he lived in God's protection because this was Rome, right? But he preached the kingdom and he taught about Jesus, Yeshua. And his travailing prayer in Galatians 4.19 my little children, for whom I am again suffering birth pangs until Christ is completely and permanently formed and moulded within you. That was the prayer that we grow into the fullness of the stature of Christ, that we are conformed to the image of Christ, that Christ is completely and permanently formed and moulded within us. So there's two things we are to be concerned about, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching Jesus. Big difference between preaching and teaching. Now, we know that a year, what is it, a day is as a thousand years. So this was written, you know, the, back then it's roughly 2,000 years into the AD. 
I mean, this was 2,000 years ago, roughly. One day is as a thousand years. We are coming into the third day for the church, the third day church, which is resurrection. <laughs> Jesus is coming back for a glorious church. And I am so fed up with doom and gloom. I am fed up with, you know, Antichrist and this and that and Mark of the Beast. Jesus didn't tell us to look out for any of that. He said, look out for my return. He you know, get, a, get around doing what I've called you to do. Well, yeah, we need to be intelligent. We need to be wise. But how about just listening to the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Just listening to him. So um, Bruce D. Allen has a great book on the third day. This is the third day church. And after 2,000 years, we're entering into the next 1,000 years. I don't know how long that's going to be before Jesus returns or how short. I have no idea. But this is the third day. And so in this season and in this time, the whole fivefold is coming together for the purpose of preaching the kingdom of God and teaching Jesus. If you need to get up and move around, Shelley, if you need to get up. Fivefold, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. The apostle is the thumb because that is the thumb reaches every other digit on the hand. The finger that points is the prophet. The, the finger that reaches out further than anyone else is the evangelist. The one with the ring on it is the pastor because they shepherd the people, they love the people, they want to bring them in. And the teacher is the little finger because it gets in your ear. You know, like it just you just need to hear the teaching. But the apostle is the important one because if, if none of the others are around, the apostle can then prophesy, the apostle can evangelize, the apostle can pastor with a lot of grace, and the apostle can teach. So that's, that's the, the, the thumb that can reach every finger. But that's the way it's supposed to work. That's the way God designed it to be. That's the way it was in the early church. And that's the way God is restoring now. So there are, as I said, there are seven functions that the fivefold ministry gifts are to empower the saints with. And they actually align with the tabernacle of Moses, with the outer court and the holy, and the, the holy of holies. Um, the titles, as I explained before, they're just functions. It's what we do. It's not who we are, right? Nothing can take away from me that I'm, I'm God's child. I'm a kingdom citizen, but my job is apostolic or whatever it might be. So that's, that's the history. That's what I want you to see, what's been taken and what God is restoring. And next week we're going to be looking at the fivefold giftings to a certain extent, how they align with the tabernacle. Because God is a, pat God, is a God of oh, just, oh, he's just wonderful. Yeah. You know, but the shadows and the patterns in the word of God and, and everywhere you turn around you see Jesus. Um, like I, I think it was last week. Well, week before, I don't know, <laughs> run together. But where it says in Genesis, you know, that the sin, um, Cain brought his offering and God said, well, you know, sin is crouching at the door and you've got to master it. That word sin is actually the sin offering. If you go back to the original language, it is not the sin crouching at the door, which sounds incredibly menacing, doesn't it? <laughs> and terrifying and I've got to master this thing or it's going to get you. It was actually the sin offering was lying at the door. And when it says crouching at the door, it was bound, ready for sacrifice. It was pointing to Jesus. All Cain had to do was acknowledge. He just had to acknowledge. So we've got a lot of stuff that's been drilled into us because it's come from our education, it's come from the intellect, it's come from, well, this makes sense. Well, let me tell you something about God. He's a God of mysteries. And quite frankly, if it makes logical sense, I'm a little bit nervous because logical sense is way secondary to spiritual understanding. So God is wanting to bring him back to the mysteries. He's wanting to unfold depths of revelation, unfold depths of revelation. So, you know, when I, I, I bring things and I'm going to get other people to come in and to talk on these things and, and Mike's going to share on some stuff and, and people that are, have it in their hearts. You know, But I want you to understand what we say, take it home and pray about it. And God, what are you telling me? But don't let anything drive you away from intimacy. 
and from a rec understanding that God is bringing is into restoration. Jesus is re re restrained in heaven until the restoration of all things. Acts chapter 3, verse 21. He is restrained. He's held back until the restoration of all things. He might be held back for a little bit longer than we think. The restoration of all things. That's why we've got to bring heaven to earth. That's why we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to influence us and intoxicate us and take us where he wants to take us. There is so much and there's so many books out there. You know, like I said, there's so many um, books that I've read and gleaned and I've, I've jotted things down. So I, I'd like to honour, it's not me, but I am hungry to, to form us into the apostolic hub. I've waited for people to grow and, to, and I thought, I'm not waiting anymore, we're doing it. Yeah. And if you come along on the journey, awesome. And if you think it's not for you, well, bless you, awesome. But we need to become what God's called us to become yeah, um, because we are called to disciple the nations. Yeah. So part of that is we are part of the ascended generation. We have been resurrected with Christ, but we haven't stopped at the resurrection. We are ascended with him. You are part of the ascended generation. You are also beyond human. And the more you get that in your heads and understand from your heart that you are beyond being a human being, you are a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. You are a spiritual being who happens to have a soul and live inside an earth suit, a body, but you are a spiritual being being more than anything else kainos brand new creation k-i-n-o-s kainos something that's never been seen before something that is brand new something that is just so out of the box but we get born again and we put it back in the box so that we can understand what's happened to us and we can explain it to people instead of saying, I haven't got a clue what happened to me. I just know I was in one kingdom, now I'm in another and I'm totally loved. And, and before that, you know, like I was living but it wasn't easy and it was hard and I had problems. But after Jesus, God came back into my life. God filled my body. My body is now filled and flooded with God himself. The life of God has been restored to me. The life of God has been restored. Yes. It's not about being saved because that sounds so external. Before we were born again, the, the spirit of God in us was dormant, dead. We did not have the life of God in us. But when we got born again, the life of God was poured back into us. You are now alive with the very life of God. You are eternally alive. You live from the power of Christ's endless, indestructible life on the inside of you. You're, you are renewed. Your youth is renewed. He renews your skin. It just, you know, for goodness sake, we limit the most amazing God because we need to understand we we need to have it logical. It needs to make sense. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't need to make sense. It just needs to be accepted by faith because how can a, an, a finite mind, and dear God, I'm not a genius, how can this receive everything that God has done? How can this explain what God has done? Well, I can't. I can't. How do you explain Christ in us, the hope of glory? How do you explain? I, I just, I don't know, I just asked Jesus into my life and I got ripped out of one kingdom and put in another. Like, you know, like I was, I was uprooted and transplanted and how do you explain this? You can't. You cannot explain what God has done. Our English words are so pathetic. You can't explain it. God is amazing. So it's not about what your head can receive. It's about what your spirit does with God, how your spirit moves, how your spirit molds with the Holy Spirit. It's all about that. It's about the life of God being poured back into you, a body holy filled and flooded with God himself. So if our bodies are filled and flooded with God himself, Ephesians 3.19 is there any room for sickness and disease? No. There is no room. There's no room for loneliness, anxiety, fear or worry. But we've got to live by revelation. Man does not live by word alone, but by, you know, but by the bread of God, the revelation, the rhema. Come on, you cannot explain that. Stop thinking about that. Just be mystical. 
<laughs> Just be mystical. Yeah, I can't explain it. I can't explain it. I can't explain what God has done for us. I am so grateful, though. And deep calls to deep. My spirit gets it, but my mind cannot contain it. So we've got to learn to flow. So when you see what's happened, that they went into caretaker mode, they went into we've got to just like, you know, protect where we are in the, when in, way back in the beginning and that was the beginning of everything being lost. When you see that when the crusade started and they went from spiritual protection, spiritual prayer, spiritual war to natural war, mm. we ended the dark ages. That's why we cannot allow the flesh any room in our life. We can't allow ourselves to be demoted to live a natural lifestyle because that opens the door to the enemy, the darkness. And I just want the glory. So this is the beginning and we are moving into um, training up apostolic hubs. And I am prophesying that this will not be the only one. I see them throughout Australia. I see the hand of God on this. I see it being birthed in other cities, other towns, other places. But this is, the, this, this is where we start. So we're going to ground ourselves in this and you'll find your rightful place. And we come together and we'll have different groups of fivefold. And some of you will have different assignments. You know, like for one, what's the future of open heaven? Where are we going? I'm apostolic. I'm not always a seer. I don't always get the prophetic. I'm apostolic. So this, this, you know, we need each other when we, we come together, the fivefold comes together, the wholeness of Christ is released. Yeah. It's not one-sided anymore. So we need to, you know, release the teachers, the evangelists, the prophets, and all of that. So, and I'm sorry, it's, it's, good. it's good. very teachering today, but I wanted to lay the foundation so that you can get excited about what God is doing and the restoration and what he, and what, well, just, I just love God. I just love God. I just love what he's doing. I just love it.